Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first panel of our 2022 Norris and Marjorie Benditson Epic Symposium on Problems Without Passports. So the topic of today's panel is social media, contending with extremism and misinformation in the digital age. My name is Janya Gambhir, and I am from New Delhi, India. I'm currently a junior studying computer science and international relations. As global access to the internet rapidly increases, social media continues to revolutionize our communication and provide us with tools to interact with people around the world. The borderless flow of information that social media grants us, however, can easily threaten our safety. In fact, we have seen how the line between online safety and personal safety has been blurred with the role that digital communication plays in developing radical ideologies, inciting people to violence, and helping states maintain power. Social media has revolutionized terrorism, acting as a tool to streamline communication in underground networks and make the recruitment of individuals more accessible. This has resulted in the increased dissemination of extremist content online facilitating radicalization. Moreover, social media has even become a weapon which states use to blast disinformation into walled echo chambers, inciting others to violence. Disinformation warfare is accompanied by plagues of misinformation, cyber harassment, and cyberbullying. It is important to recognize the digital threats that we all face and assess how certain platforms may be exploited in the future and play a role in the radicalization and recruitment of individuals, as well as the disinformation perpetrated by states. I would like to thank all three panelists for being here today. Before I introduce them, I would like to explain how the panel will run. Each panelist will first present their opening remarks for five minutes each. This is to ensure that we have enough time for the next segments of the panel, which is a moderated discussion among the panelists, as well as a question and answer session with the audience. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panelist who is in person today, Mr. Sh Brett Schaefer, who is a senior fellow and head of the Alliance for Securing Democracy's Information Manipulation Team. Mr. Schaefer, is the creator and manager of Hamilton 2.0, an online open source dashboard tracking the outputs of Russian, Chinese, and Iranian state media outlets, diplomats, and government officials. He was also recently quoted in the New York Times for his research on Russian state disinformation during the Ukraine war. Mr. Schaefer, if you'd like to proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you so much. And it's, it's nice to be here actually in person for the first time in two years. I've done a lot of these virtually. So it's good to see live faces. It makes it a little easier. So in discussing the problem of information manipulation, and radicalization, I think there's a tendency to focus on the content. And for my colleagues who look at violent extremism, of course, the content is a problem. I mean, nobody's going to argue that the video of a violent beheading is within the bounds of protected free speech. It should be moderated, it should be taken down. Most of my work looking at state-backed propaganda, but even misinformation, disinformation, oftentimes the content is not necessarily the problem. At least it's not illegal. In many cases, it doesn't violate terms of service. So we have to adopt a slightly different framework in how we view information threats. And so a lot of us in the disinfo community have adopted what we call the ABCDE framework. I did not create this, just to be clear, it's something we use in our work, but it, it is not my own. So A is the actor, who's behind an information campaign. Oftentimes it's governments. So governments, the number one target tends to be the domestic audience, but of course we've seen governments targeting foreign audiences as well. Then you have political parties, you have politically motivated individuals. We've of course seen that in the US in the 2020 context. Then you have mercenaries, you have the sort of four hire companies who will run disinformation campaigns for you. Oftentimes that's to damage someone's reputation or actually to do reputation management to try to sort of cleanse someone's reputation. And then you have paid influencers. So of course, the same people who are pushing out, you know, fun trips to the Maldives are also now being hired by states to run propaganda campaigns for them. 
So there's a wide variety of actors we have to look at, but it's important to know the actor to understand the motivation. So the B in the framework is behavior. So what kind of manipulative behaviors are being exhibited in this campaign? So if you look at the Internet Research Agency back in 2016, 98, 99 percent of the content was absolutely acceptable content if it had been posted by a real American. It did not violate terms of service. Often it was not disinformation. The problem, of course, is that they were using fake accounts and they were misrepresenting themselves. So you had someone in St. Petersburg with geopolitical motivations presenting themselves as a Black Lives Matter activist, a Second Amendment supporter, and using that to embed themselves into American communities, American conversations to sort of manipulate from within. So we often look at the behavior. Is there manipulative behavior? And this is fake accounts. This is hijacking accounts. This is spamming activity. This is paid trolling activity. C, of course, is the content. And so besides just looking at the content from a sort of true false perspective, we also then look at content such as manipulated video and audio or images taken out of context. So there's a lot of ways to manipulate an audience through content that doesn't necessarily get into a falsehood per se that you could debunk. D then is the degree. So what is the scope of the campaign? That's how many audiences it's going to reach on how many platforms. What is the virality of it? What's the scale and what's the adoption? So by that we mean we don't want to try to address every single bit of mis or disinformation that we see. Because of course, when you address it, you amplify it. You give it a little bit more oxygen. So before we make the determination about whether or not to respond, we want to see how widespread it is. Sometimes this is a bit of a judgment call, but of course, the nice thing about social media, you do have engagement metrics. You can get a sense of how widespread it is. But the adoption part is sometimes a little bit difficult to judge because you can have something that exists in social media very much in a small echo chamber, but then it gets adopted by traditional media. It's sort of spun up in a different direction and it takes on a life of its own. And then the E in the framework is effect. So essentially, how much of a threat does this information campaign pose? Is there a threat to individual reputation? Does it cause polarization? Is there a public health concern? Is there a public safety concern or national security concern? or concern to democracy. So these are all things that we look at in sort of analyzing whether or not a piece of mis or disinformation is worth responding to. Because you can have falsehoods that really have no real kind of real world negative impacts. And so it's just not worth spending your time trying to debunk those. The one thing I wanted to talk about tonight too is within this framework, I don't think enough attention is paid to distribution and how content actually reaches audiences. What bad actors understand is what everyone who spent any time in a marketing class understands. You need to reach an audience. My old career was in the film industry. So like the dirty secret there is it didn't matter how good your film was. You had to have a good marketing campaign. You had to have a distribution campaign. If you existed just in the wilds of very fringe film festivals, you weren't hitting your target audiences. Bad actors understand that and they understand how to manipulate information systems to make sure their content gets in front of the desired audience. This is where state-backed actors have a huge advantage over fringe extremists, because what do state-backed actors have? They have a lot of resources. So you have state media accounts, you have government platforms, you can pay trolls, you can pay influencers. So you look at Chinese propaganda. On Facebook alone, Chinese state media right now has over a billion followers. That is definitely inflated, but even if you cut that in half, half million followers. They have legitimate outlets. So if somebody searches on Google for information about Xinjiang, you're likely to get a Chinese state media outlet there. So you can influence people that way. Then of course, they have the ability to pay trolls and influencers. We saw this around the Beijing Olympics. They spent roughly a half million dollars to pay American influencers to go on Instagram, report positively about the Olympics. However, other bad actors that don't have those resources still can find creative ways to reach an audience. So a lot of this work is sort of drawn from this thinking called data and society, and it relies on this concept of data voids. What extremists understand is that oftentimes you just need to sort of prime the audience to search for a term where there's not a lot of credible content there. So say you're a white nationalist. You want to change people's perceptions about the Holocaust. You know, though, if they run Holocaust as a search, 
they're not going to be sent to your fringy white nationalist site. So you get a little bit more creative and you understand certain percentage of users are going to have a typo in their search. They're going to misspell Holocaust. So we've seen white nationalists intentionally misspell Holocaust in some of their outputs, knowing that that will allow them to show up in search rankings. You see this also with things called typo squatting. So I think everyone has probably done this. You try to go to amazon.com, you put in an N instead of an M and you're led to this other platform. So you see bad actors often try to essentially adopt and squat on a URL that is close to what a user would try to go to. So there's a lot of creative ways that bad actors think about reaching audiences so that they are able to get their content in front of people. And this is all attacks against information systems, not necessarily the content itself. So just to wrap up, it's obviously important when we kind of dissect the problem to think about content, what is true, what is false, how we should refute it, what are the best strategies. But I think we do a very poor job of thinking about dissemination and how content reaches people, and in particular, how it reaches people that may not have been drawn to that content originally. It's one thing for a user to say, I'm interested in the Russian perspective on this. I'm going to go to RT.com. It's very different for that user to say, I don't know anything about the crash of MH17 over Ukraine. I'm going to type that as a neutral search query. And then eight of my top 10 results are Russian state media, which is what we found before there was the ban on Russian state media. So that's just the thing I wanted to stress at the top, that there's a sort of wide array of potential issues to look at here. It's not just a content problem. We have to think about behavior. We have to think about the actor, the effect, but also the distribution and the dissemination of problematic content. Thanks. Thank you so much for your compelling remarks, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, next up for our panelists today is Ms. Heather Williams. She is a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and a professor at Party Rand Graduate School. She focuses on violent extremism, homeland security, Middle East regional issues, and intelligence policy and methodology. In her 12 years with the intelligence community, she worked at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Special Operations Intelligence Center, and the Department of Homeland Security and Transportation Security Administration. She is the co-author of the Online Extremist Ecosystem. We are keen to hear your remarks now, Ms. Williams. Great, thank you. And so sorry that I can't be there in person. I um, I went to college in Boston and I kind of love this area of Massachusetts. So I bet the audience may be a little bit sad that they can't be with me here in sunny Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> but in these brief introductory remarks, I wanna emphasize uh, three points um, based off the work that I've done here at RAND, uh, looking at how extremists use online spaces and also how uh, truth decay, which we define as the decreasing confidence um, in institutions that disseminate fact um, and the difficulty in distinguishing between fact and opinion and how that affects national security. And in my research, the first um, point that I think is useful for this audience um, is the fact that extremists use the same internet that, that you do. There is no separate internet. There is no extremist internet out there. Um, although there are some dedicated platforms uh, like Stormfront, for example, a discussion forum um, dedicated towards white supremacy, established by white supremacists. Um, and although the fact since 2016, 2017, we've seen the emergence of some alternate technology or alt tech platforms that are more likely to have extremist content on them than mainstream content, most extremist content in, in raw volume is still going to be on the mainstream platforms that most people use. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Um, these platforms, despite their increase in content moderation, particularly since 2015 or so, still host a large volume of misinformation, of um, hateful, dehumanizing content. And given the use of algorithms so that individuals have a fairly tailored user experience on these types of platforms, um, you are able to create often sort of echo chamber of negative ideas, if you start to seek those out, um, that can kind of put you even on these very mainstream platforms into a more narrow uh, kind of universe of material that's being presented to you that would have a, a large volume of, of misinformation and information serving an extremist agenda. <clears throat> In some cases, 
algorithms are even encouraging and pushing users into uh, it's kind of darker, more extreme material. I mean, it also lowers the barriers of entry for a lot of individuals because it's already on the platforms that, that they use. I mean, that would bring me to the second I think, key point for this audience, which is that online spaces can incubate radicalization. We all have a natural human tendency um, to seek out like-minded individuals, to look for information that can affirm our prior beliefs. And the internet pro provides a very dangerous environment for those human tendencies and for those cognitive biases. Um, and we see in how social media currently operates, particularly on highly political topics, is that it tends to push people um, towards more partisan, more politicized positions. Um, it tends to reinforce that material. Uh, extremist platforms can give uh, or sorry, uh, online platforms, social media platforms can give extremist groups um, the impression to users that they are more popular than they are, that their ideas are more mainstream, more commonly affirmed than they may be. Um, we heard a little bit, I think, of this kind of hinted at by Brett. You know, you could search for something, particularly maybe if you've been primed for a more unique term. Um, you can search for something that would give you a lot of results that seem like they're legitimate, that kind of have similar packaging um, as a more mainstream idea and could make someone think that they've you know, uncovered uh, some, some new theory or they've uncovered actually something that's, that's commonly held by, by many others as opposed to a very narrow window of individuals who are promoting these, these extreme ideas. Um, but one thing that I think is particularly concerning is, is how social media and online spaces can launder extreme ideas into the mainstream. And that's something that we've really seen happening um, in the last decade or so. That you can push an idea, get it reinforced, um, get it described by others using perhaps coded language or oblique references, and essentially take that extreme idea and over time by having it repeated um, or disseminated via different mechanism, mechanisms, make it seem like it is no longer so extreme um, or water it down slightly so that more people are willing to repeat it, they're willing to disseminate it, but it actually still ties back at its core um, to an idea that is based in tr traditional kind of uh, uh, neo-Nazi philosophies, white supremacist philosophies, Christian identity movement, you know, ideas that perhaps in their, in their raw form, all of us would easily recognize as, as extremely distasteful. And I think the third point that is really important uh, to, to reinforce is that we, and I say we here, I mean, particularly in the United States, are doing very little to stop this. Um, I recognize we're talking to a global audience um, but this problem is principally in the United States um, in terms of the platforms that we are using for social media are generally owned and operated in the United States. We're one of we're the most prolific social media users in the US. And users engaged in this type of discourse are generally in the United States. The disinformation picture is important um, and it's great to have Brett here to speak to some of uh, those issues, um, but I think it is very important to keep in mind and to recognize that the bulk of extreme discourse is authentic discourse. It is individuals who are, you know, in their true name or, or who are true individuals, perhaps not doing it in their true names and their true identities, um, but true individuals who are retweeting, liking, engaging, pushing out material. It's amplified. By, dis by, by actors um, who may have more nefarious purposes, other adversarial actors that are trying to drive wedges and increase schisms inside the American public or um, in other Western or other publics. Um, but for the most part, and I, I guess I should clarify here, I'm thinking in particular of some of the far right extremism that we see here in the United States. Um, this is generally pretty authentic speech. Um, and I think in terms of far right extremism that we see, there's very little that's being done in the United States. Um, generally, the tools that we have to respond are security, law enforcement oriented tools. Uh, there is very little done in terms of counter narratives. 
Um, as, as Brett mentioned in his comments, you know, some of uh, much of this is acceptable content in the sense that it is a uh, legal speech. Um, it doesn't violate the content policies of the platform where it is posted. That doesn't mean that it's healthy speech. That doesn't mean that it's good speech. Um, and it doesn't mean that there would not be benefits to American democracy, uh, to um, American society, um, and also to the rest of the world as we are increasingly exporting uh, some of this far right speech in particular um, and trying to counter it. So there's very little done in terms of counter narrative, in terms of um, social engagement, in terms of inoculation. So prepping individuals so that if they were to encounter misinformation or disinformation, they would recognize it for what it was, or they would at least be disinclined um, to agree with it or to promote it. Um, so all of these things are very important. Um, and, and I think this is a good transition to Oliver at the end, who is doing some counter-violent extremism programming, and he may agree or disagree with me about um, how much is being, is being done. But I think there is certainly room for uh, much more to be done to counter misinformation, to counter extreme information on social media platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much for your perspective. So our last panelist for today is Mr. Oliver Wilcox, who is the director for countering violent extremism in the US Department of State. He forms and spearheads countering transnational white supremacist violent extremism, terrorist rehabilitation and reintegration teams. Previously, he served as the state's CVE deputy director and CVE program director. Oliver, Mr. Oliver Wilcox also worked in different Middle East positions at the U.S. Agency for International Development, including in Tunisia and Yemen. He is also a Tufts University alumni, having gotten his BA with honors in political science and Spanish. We're very keen to hear your remarks now, Mr. Wilcox. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much uh, to uh, Epic for having me back. And I'm glad uh, to follow uh, Brett and Heather. So what I would like to do is take a step back and talk about uh, the problem of violent extremism and the responses that are part of countering violent extremism or CVE as we call it, uh, and obviously tie them very closely uh, to uh, the online uh, dynamics that uh, my fellow panelists, I think, have done a good job of outlining. Uh, so violent extremism and countering violent extremism obviously uh, includes a lot more than the online content uh, and the traffic uh, that uh, goes back and forth. Uh, people are obviously uh, it should be noted, not sort of empty vessels waiting to be filled with whatever content they may uh, read or engage with uh, online. Uh, there are obviously other factors uh, at work. Uh, and in particular, there are psychosocial factors that are at work. Uh, and that's true domestically as well as uh, globally. And uh, the types of uh, factors that uh, we see at play and that have been documented anecdotally and uh, unfortunately not uh, statistically, but they include uh, seeking a sense of adventure, uh, wanting uh, a uh, peer group, uh, looking for community, belonging, uh, these sorts of things. So uh, these psychosocial factors are uh, really key drivers uh, from the outset. Uh, the process of radicalization or recruitment into violent extremism uh, or just inspiration if you are a lone actor um, is uh, a highly individualized pathway uh, and that can be true even uh, among the same cohort uh, of of potentially vulnerable individuals. So uh, there's an element here of uh, looking for a needle in a haystack, uh, which is obviously a challenge in terms of the response. Uh, so uh, CBE deals with uh, prevention, intervention, and at the back end, 
what we call rehabilitation and reintegration. And uh, we're doing this work uh, in particular, um, or we're supporting it in other countries uh, as those countries take their um, citizens back from uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, and this is particularly the case with um, spouses and children that have returned to countries like Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, and also a couple of the Western Balkans countries. Uh, and they're also uh, returning to uh, European countries um, in smaller numbers. So uh, our addressing the online issue uh, is part of a much broader approach. Uh, and I would argue that the um, community level engagement and work that we do, uh, the face-to-face -face work that we do uh, is extremely important. And in fact, um, I would argue that um, the um, online and the offline need to be looked at together, not just analytically, uh, but uh, as part of the response. Uh, so for example, uh, Heather mentioned counter narratives. Uh, one can do obviously or support counter narratives online or train uh, social media influencers or would-be influencers to develop more interesting or compelling content in their local context. But uh, how is that being linked with uh, what's happening on the ground in a particular locale uh, in real life? And um, those linkages are important. And I think we're getting there, but um, we're not necessarily uh, linking the on and the offline uh, or the social media and the community work um, as consistently or systematically, I think, as we need to. And one could argue, well, what's the point in linking these things? Uh, if you're working at a community level, uh, you're probably working with people maybe in the dozens, if you're lucky in the hundreds, uh, that's how far your, your funding takes you uh, in terms of doing a program. Whereas if you work online, you're reaching a much broader audience. Uh, but I think there's a reach issue, uh, which obviously, uh, if you use uh, online, uh, that's key. You get uh, a lot more uh, eyeballs, as we say, uh, on the content. But if you're linking that or doing that in concert with the uh, community engagement work, um, then you actually have positive content uh, that you can uh, disseminate. Uh, and if Radicalization and recruitment are phenomena that are still taking place uh, to a significant degree uh, in a local context, then um, that local perspective and that local experience and that local content that you may get from community engagement work, uh, I think, uh, is important. Uh, the other thing I think that needs to be uh, mentioned uh, particularly um, when it comes to developing countries, is that the online or the internet and social media um, are very linked with or, and increasingly linked with traditional media. And so uh, you may have uh, satellite channels uh, in some countries, for example, uh, that have online platforms, right? So you go to the, uh, I'll say hypothetically the Al Jazeera uh, <clears throat> channel and you go to their website and um, they have uh, their own um, you know online surveys or polls or whatever and so uh, you know many people particularly younger generations are um, engaging across platforms uh, so I think you know therefore our work has to be uh, across platforms uh, as well now, obviously, violent extremists, whether they are um, racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, uh, white supremacists in particular, uh, whether they are of other uh, ideolo ideologies, uh, they uh, manipulate uh, mis and disinformation. They use it. Uh, sometimes they create it uh, themselves. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that sort of weaponization um, is part of their uh, part of their uh, mo, so to speak. Now, obviously, Heather touched on this, but here in the United States, we have um, a little thing called the First Amendment, uh, 
uh, which um, is sort of the legal underpinning for uh, why so much of this content is allowed to be uh, online. And um, the bar here in the US is obviously set quite high uh, in terms of um, content that um, can legally be removed. Uh, and that bar, that threshold is very often um, incitement to violence, right? Uh, and even that, uh, if you ask the Department of Justice, has a, a particular uh, legal definition to it. Uh, if you look at other countries, um, particularly our Western European allies and partners, uh, they have, um, you know, a wide range of um, legal regimes and regulatory systems uh, for dealing with um, what they think is, uh, or what many of us would agree is um, objectionable or abhorrent content online, uh, but they are able to actually uh, much more easily um, you know, order something to be um, taken down. Of course, the problem with that uh, is that um, you remove one piece of content uh, and there are many uh, thousands uh, of other pieces of content that uh, are out there uh, at the same time. Um, so uh, what we tend to promote uh, with other countries uh, is what we call uh, voluntary collaboration. Uh, and this is the uh, companies uh, doing uh, their own uh, monitoring and enforcement of terms of service. Uh, I think they've certainly made some progress in that regard. Uh, our concern is obviously that um, by promoting uh, the sort of heavy regulatory uh, or uh, legal restrictions uh, that we may actually be uh, in some other contexts uh, encouraging, you know, authoritarian practices. Uh, so that's some, something else that we have to be mindful of. Um, I'll just mention in closing a couple of the programs that uh, we have supported. Uh, and I think this gets to Heather's point about um, counter narratives. Uh, we certainly uh, internationally have been supporting quite a few of these efforts. Um, I think they're probably still a drop in the bucket compared to uh, what um, our various uh, violent extremist and terrorist opponents uh, online uh, and otherwise uh, are uh, disseminating. But um, the two uh, projects that I'll mention in particular, one is called Invent to Prevent. And this is a, a, a university-based uh, program where uh, students in um, particular courses, international relations, uh, or political science, or even law, uh, or pre-law, uh, basically uh, sign up to uh, develop their own online campaigns, activities, small initiatives. Sometimes they combine that with uh, community-based uh, work. So again, that online offline uh, linkage and this is a program that has been done in hundreds and hundreds of universities, uh, both here in the US, uh, a number of universities uh, in West Africa, East Africa, the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, other Gulf countries, um, into Southeast Asia. So uh, it um, has uh, kind of taken on a life of its own and um, you know we're very grateful to Facebook for um, having helped support um, previous uh, years uh, of that particular work. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention here, um, and this is really important. Thank you important so much, Mr. Me. Wilcox. Unfortunately, we're running short on time, so I'll ask you to conclude as soon as possible. Thank yes. you. Yes. So the last and the final thing I'll mention, um, and I think Brett was kind of touching on this, um, it's really important for us to get digital and media literacy at scale. Uh, this means doing it in schools, uh, obviously in age appropriate ways. Uh, we're doing it in sort of fits and starts uh, in various countries around the world, but this is a staple. This is the long game uh, in uh, dealing with uh, online violent extremism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Wilcox, and a huge thank you to all our panelists. So now we'll be proceeding to the moderated discussion section of this event.
Uh, the questions will be open to all panelists, and we'd love to hear all your different perspectives. So first, now more than ever, we are seeing the spread of three forms of wrong information online and hearing about the problem. Misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. Before we discuss these topics in depth, can you help us all understand the three forms of false information and their potential dangers? How do they differ? And how do they lead to extremist behavior? Maybe jump in first, I'll abuse my in-person uh, abilities. So we, we, we use a little bit different uh, terminology. So we almost never use the term fake news anymore because of a certain former president. Uh, the term just it, it lost its meaning. Uh, so when I was studying this in grad school, you know, 2014, that was a term that was used, but it just has been abandoned. So we use mis, dis, and malinformation. So to define them, misinformation is the promotion of a falsehood, but there's no intent to mislead. So that's your crazy uncle on Facebook who watches Infowars 12 hours a day and truly believes the information he's putting out. Disinformation is false information where there is an intent to mislead. So this often is government disinformation campaigns. I mean, clearly they know what they're putting out is false. There's specific intent behind it. And there is the desire to create an effect, whether that is to change people's voting habits, to change the opinion about a war. Their intent is, is to create a change of behavior. The more complicated one is malinformation. So malinformation is true information but presented without context or with misleading context with the intent to mislead. So that gets a little bit sticky. But to give you an example there, a lot of our work looking at Russian coverage of Western vaccines existed in the world of malinformation because it was technically true, but it was just as misleading as if they had created it whole cloth. So you take an RT headline saying, seven people die in Spanish nursing home after receiving Pfizer vaccine. It happened, it's true, at about page or paragraph nine, they say it had absolutely nothing to do with the vaccine. So that is in the world of malinformation. It's true, but it's misleading. You see this around statistics a lot too. You present statistics, you don't give the context. So people have sort of a warped perception of reality. And that's also what actually Homeland Security uses. They use the MDM, so mis, dis, and malinformation. Thank you so much for providing us with these definitions. It's very helpful as we frame the rest of this discussion. So next, when it was first popularized, Social media was hailed as liberation technology that would spread democracy across the globe. However, in recent years, authoritarian regimes realized the threat of pro-democracy online opposition and developed tactics to uphold their power. How does social media impact democracy, both from a state perspective and an individual perspective? So I can uh, draw the first straw here. I mean, I, I just, it's obviously a really, really big and broad and important question. I think that for me, the big takeaway um, is that social media can cut both ways, right? So a fair bit of my work uh, has been done on Iran, and I think this is a good example of a case where social media has both allowed for individuals to mobilize at a popular level against an oppressive regime, but has also allowed that oppressive regime mechanisms to identify who might be sympathetic to democratic ideas, who might be working against them, and to use those same platforms to, to target them. Um, so I think it is, you know, social media, like many technologies, it depends on whose hands it's in, what is their uh, purpose in using it. Um, I think an important question um, when we think about uh, social media platforms and that relationship with democracy is, you know, when platforms might be willing to adopt different rules for different countries and sometimes adopting rules that serve an authoritarian country's uh, needs a little bit, allowing greater censorship, for example, than they might be willing to allow in a democracy. So I think it's very important to recognize that the social media companies themselves, you know, th their primary intent may not be to protect democracy. You know, they, they have economic motives that can create you know, a conflict of interest if we're thinking about democracy as being what we really want to be the, the purpose of, of social media. Thank you so much. Uh, so next, 
if any of the other panelists would like to contribute on this question, that would be great. So maybe I can just add uh, a couple of uh, things here. Uh, so uh, let me just, in terms of the, the different types of um, information um, that are out there, I, I mentioned at the conclusion um, of my remarks that, you know, the long game here um, is really uh, digital literacy. And again, as I pose the question, how do we do this at scale? Uh, we have many examples of it being done um, in countries around the world, but um, a few examples of it being sort of mainstreamed uh, in uh, education systems. Uh, you need to equip sort of the rising and future generations um, with uh, the sort of you know knowledge, skills, and abilities to um, be able to recognize this. And you have to be able to do it, um, as I said before, in age appropriate um, and um, you know increasingly uh, compelling ways. Um, just as the technology changes, and particularly as youth uh, and even now children. Um, their sort of online habits change and the technology changes, the digital literacy efforts are going to have to keep pace with that. Uh, so there are inherent challenges um, in this. And I think this is true for building resiliency to violent extremism uh, or uh, to malinformation uh, or to, um, you know, uh, promoting um, or guarding, um, you know, sort of civic uh, uh, sentiment uh, or support for uh, democracy. Thank you so much, Mr. Schaefer. They covered it, so we can we can move on to the next because yeah. I know we're a little behind. Uh, so next, the internet does not simply allow for the dissemination and consumption of extremist material in a one-way broadcast from producer to consumer, but also high levels of online social interaction around this material. How have terrorist recruitment dynamics changed over time? And how has social media strengthened terrorist consolidation efforts? Conversely, how have states used the interactive dynamics of social media to their advantage, such as in the case of Russia and Ukraine? So maybe I can take the first part of that and then um, I would defer to my colleagues uh, to uh, deal with the state side of that. So uh, terrorists, obviously, uh, one can say it about Al Qaeda these days, um, not so much for uh, Al Qaeda senior leer leadership uh, in past years, uh, but you know, ISIS obviously was the um, you know the prototypical. Um, you know, use all the current uh, technologies available to them um, and not just have their leaders use it uh, for propaganda purposes. Um, but in a way, there was kind of a democratization uh, of um, the propaganda because uh, you had, um, particularly in the early years of the so-called caliphate, you had, um, you know, recently arrived foreign fighters uh, who were uh, you know, taking videos of themselves and uh, taking selfies and posting them and talking to uh, their peers back home and telling them, you know, how cool this was or what a great project this so-called caliphate was going to be to build and to contribute to. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was, uh, I think, kind of an important shift. Uh, if you look at uh, racially or ethnically motivated and particularly uh, white supremacist uh, violent extremism, um, you know, you see uh, a move to um, more, um, you know, use of um, encrypted apps and, um, you know, a move to um, platforms like Telegram, uh, which obviously uh, are uh, different from Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, but even there, you have a use of, uh, and it, it died down during COVID, but my, my guess is that it will pick back up, um, 
you see some of the online offline linkages that I was talking about before. Uh, so for example, mixed martial arts competitions uh, are uh, and continue to be popular uh, among uh, these actors. And um, they, uh, you know, are things that get, you know, disseminated online and uh, they become content online. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that this is going to pick back up, particularly as COVID restrictions, travel restrictions, um, you know, appear to be waning. But um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues if they have anything to add. Sure, I'll just add to that first question because I think Brett's best position probably to answer the second piece. Um, it, you know, I point, I think about where we really see a shift is in 2016, 2017, um, in ISIS's ability to use social media in ways that um, is other than that, that sort of original Al Qaeda had never done as successfully. And, and some of what they did was um, to put out more multimedia, to put out more foreign language media, so more than just Arabic media, so translating things in English, translating things in other Western languages. And that was very successful in propagating their message and in recruiting foreign fighters um, around the world. It was, however, very branded um, with sort of an ISIS brand, and that also enabled a lot of the major social media platforms to target it and to try to deplatform it, which they started doing um, concertedly around 2017. Um, so I think that that is an important kind of moment in how terrorists were using the internet. Um, I think that there have been lessons learned by other extremist um, movements in how uh, ISIS used the internet. And I think that the way in which these other movements are more are structured, so um, more decentralized, they don't use this clear branding, they use more coded language, makes it very difficult for um, platform administrators to take the same successes that they had against ISIS and translate it um, to other extremist movements. I don't think they have the same political will either. Um, and so I think we see that, you know, there, that, that ISIS kind of started something and it's hard for that to be put back in the box. And I'll defer to Brett on the, the kind of state issues. Yeah, on the state issues, I, I mean, I think the way you phrase the question is important because everyone online is not just a consumer, they're a producer of information, even if all they're doing is retweeting. So baked into the strategy of an information operation is to try to get it adopted by real users, especially influential real users. So this, this goes by many terms. I mean, they term it the Russians, agents of influence, useful idiots. The real goal is to try to get, let's, let's, take America as the target audience, real Americans to adopt it, to spread it on their own. So that is, is core to the strategy of the sort of two-way exchange of information to at times meet people where they are, give them content that attracts them, um, mixed martial arts, but often with the sort of Russian example, they talk about domestic issues. So they attract people through issues that resonate with the left or right, then kind of bring you in the fold and hope that then you adopt some of their talking points. So it really is that sort of two-way exchange, but that is kind of core to the strategy. I mean, this is going back to Soviet times. You found an influential person on the ground who does your bidding for you, because again, that distances yourself from the disinformation campaign too, because you want it coming from a trusted American, not from Russian state media or Russian government official. Thank you so much. Uh, so prior to the end of the discussion section, we would love to foster a dialogue between the three speakers. Uh, do you all have any questions for each other or follow-ups or responses to each other based on everything that has been said? Yeah, I'd like to uh, touch on, uh, again, one thing uh, in the sort of broader context um, that I think is incredibly important and it gets uh, mentioned uh, in a uh, somewhat stereotypical way, but that is the the issue of um, mental health and uh, vulnerability or uh, supposed vulnerability to uh, radicalization, particularly online. Um, it is true that 
you know, lone actors um, uh, have uh, the cases of lone actors have had a higher percentage uh, of where mental health issues um, were one of the variables at work. But I think, unfortunately, implicit in uh, some of the media coverage uh, of this um, particular angle uh, of online radicalization or online violent extremism, um, you know, there's an assumption that if you, um, you know, suffer from uh, depression or anxiety, or um, I've seen this also with people uh, that um, have learning disabilities uh, or autism, that all of a sudden, pe- uh, if, if you trust some journalists uh, and what they say, uh, all of a sudden their uh, vulnerability to radicalization goes through the roof. Um, so we need to be particularly careful uh, when we talk about the sort of psychological or the mental health aspects of this, particularly in the era of uh, where we're trying to be sensitive to diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And accessibility includes neurodiversity. I, w- I was going to ask both my colleagues about, because they obviously look at a, a very different problem set than I do. So we often talk about the time to intervene, to short circuit a campaign that is going to be problematic for some reason. And so if you look at QAnon, for example, we started seeing that bubbling up in 2017. The platforms didn't really act on it till 2020. At that point, there was a huge community that had been built. And so efforts to shut it down on mainstream platforms meant that they already just had a huge infrastructure to sort of fan people off to. So my question for my colleagues is sort of in your work, at what point do you think it is necessary for platforms to intervene for it not to potentially have a backfire effect? Because in a sense, sort of reinforces the notion that, well, these mainstream big tech companies are censorship platforms and they're already, as I mentioned, plenty of other places for them to go. So I guess it's the question of knowing when to intervene um, so that you're able to kind of cut short a sort of problematic community without being kind of too heavy handed and just saying, well, there's a few people talking about this, let's shut it down. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I've done some work at looking at kind of the historic uh, evolution of online extremism. And, and I think just a, a couple of things that I would say here. I mean, I think that the, the social media companies um, did very little about any kind of negative behavior online uh, from the establishment of social media platforms in 2003 to 2005 until really 2015. It wasn't just about extremism. It was also about you know bullying and harassment and, and other kind of just bad behavior that happens on the internet. And I think there was a naivete that, you know, we went into these spaces, we promoted free speech, um, that those were good things, you know, and they would they would lead to good things. Um, and instead, uh, it allowed for, a, you know, kind of the internet, a lot of these social media platforms to go to the trolls. And, and Reddit is, I think, one of the best examples of that historical evolution. And so I, I say this history because I'm still not sure that, social media platforms want to do that. They didn't want to do that for a decade. They're starting to, I think, see in the last few years, the the real consequences of them not doing so, you know, that they are allowing things like QAnon to, you know, emerge into this absurdly popular, I say absurdly because of how absurd the actual tenets of QAnon are, um, popular, uh, theory that so many people are willing to believe in and for some of them act upon. Um, so I, I don't know if they want to do that. Um, and then if they want to do that, then there's the secondary task of trying to figure out when it's necessary, when it needs to be done. Um, I think that is also very difficult. I'm sure there is some technical assistance that could be had in, in seeing you know when an idea is looks like it's on the road to becoming viral. 
right? A certain number of ideas are going to end up being popular. And I think there probably are some technical means to help platforms identify those tipping points or when things are on those trajectories. But I'm still not convinced that that is a task that social media platforms want to fully take on. If I can just mention two things uh, to uh, hopefully get to Brett's uh, uh, question. Uh, so the first thing is um, the part of the social media companies, I would argue, sort of upping their game somewhat, uh, the sort of level of the response to this uh, is the sort of collaborative uh, group that they formed called the GIF CT. And this um, is, I think, uh, something that's still kind of in its infancy, uh, but it's basically a grouping of the large social media companies um, and then a number of the smaller platforms. Uh, and, you know, I think there's potential here because um, the larger platforms in terms of their policies and uh, the in-house expertise they have, uh, the personnel that they've hired in recent years, um, they have things to uh, sort of share with the smaller platforms that, you know, are not as well resourced. Uh, we'll see how uh, we'll see how it goes. But I think the GIF CT is uh, and it's a multilateral uh, effort, basically. So um, that's the main thing at a micro level in terms of where to intervene. Uh, one thing that um, has been gaining steam in the last few years uh, is the whole sort of redirect approach. Uh, and so I think that's something that, um, you know, it has its proponents, it has its critics, um, and it probably needs to be evaluated. Uh, nobody likes to have their work evaluated, but, uh, we always talk about metrics. Um, you have to evaluate something in order to see, uh, whether, uh, you got the results that, you know, you planned, uh, or that you um, intended. And we have to be willing to learn from some things and talk about things that didn't work as well as things that were successful. We very much like to talk about good practices um, in the field of CBE and um, countering uh, bad information or misinformation. But I think we need to also talk about things that did not work uh, so we can really learn lessons from those. Thank you so much. Uh, so that concludes our moderated discussion section. I would now like people who have questions for the panelists to come up to the center aisle microphones. I would request that you keep your remarks to a short question aimed at one panelist without any additional comments in the interest of time. Please try to keep it under one minute and please introduce yourself. Thanks so much. Hi, um, my name is Ellie Murphy and I'm part of the EPIC Colloquium this year and I had a question for Mr. Schaefer. Um, so in your opening remarks, you discussed the way that social media has the ability to promote radical ideologies that help build states and help states maintain power. Um, this includes the increased dissemination of disinformation, misinformation and malinformation online. And I was wondering if you could explain how this process has um, played out thus far in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, it's that's a it's a big question. So I'll give a I'll look at a specific example that is I probably shouldn't be shocked by, but still was. So what Russia does very well, they're sort of scavengers of the internet. And they understand the fault lines in various target communities, and they understand conspiracy theories, and they understand sort of where to find a home uh, for content and, and build off of domestic narratives. So you look at the efforts to create this idea that the US is running a bioweapons program in Ukraine. We've seen them push this for 40 years. In my five years of doing this job full time, I've debunked this thing six or seven different times often from the same exact journalist. But what they did this time is they found a twist that would make it attractive to target audiences in the US, but also in places like Hungary. 
So they said that these labs are being funded by George Soros, who's sort of public enemy number one for the Hungarian government. They connected it to Hunter Biden and his laptop. So you build this sort of reinforcement mechanism where various conspiracies are sort of building on each other. And then it's able to surface on Fox News because now you've made it familiar, you've made it relevant. So it's always kind of taking something that resonates with the domestic audience, twisting it in a way that it gets your message into that domestic audience because they just started talking about sort of their Ukrainian talking points, those probably wouldn't be adopted. But you make it familiar, you make it relevant, and you make it sort of politically beneficial for a certain audience, and then it does get adopted. So that's one example of probably many in the Ukraine context of them using domestic conspiracy theories to get sort of their foreign policy agenda amplified locally. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Mira. I'm also in this year's EPIC class. Um, I wanted to learn more about misinformation, disinformation in the form of deep fakes. Um, I've seen in the media that they've been used during this Ukraine crisis. I wanted to know how they're used generally. Are they more, are deep fakes more difficult to combat than other forms of disinformation? Um, and I'd also read another article talking about using blockchain to uh, combat, combat deep, deep fakes. I was wondering what the technological solutions to the problem are. Uh, anyone who can answer this question. But anyone, I'm helping Brett. <laughs> I, I didn't want to step on my colleague's time. So deep fakes are a problem, but I don't think the major problem when you talk about manipulated audio and video, the much bigger problem is taking video and audio out of context, repackaging it for the present and presenting it in a way that is just as misleading as if you created a whole, whole cloth. This again goes to the idea of malinformation existing in the world of disinformation. So what we've mainly seen in Ukraine are images from Libya being recycled as if they're current. We've seen sort of videos of mass graves in you know, various parts of the world being repackaged, given a different title. So that to me right now is a bigger issue than deep fakes. I mean, you can still for the most part detect deep fakes if you have some technical skill. But of course, the problem I think with looking at blockchain is that it requires some technical sophistication. So the Washington Post or the New York Times, yes, when they have their sort of digital forensic teams look at videos, they can debunk them. But that's not how social media users work. And so by the time the debunk happens in the Washington Post, that's spread all over the internet because nobody who's looking at their phone is going to take the time to go through and do sort of video verification. So I'm skeptical of, in some ways, of the technical solutions. But I also think, I mean, the, the term term of art used is cheap fakes are just as dangerous as deep fakes. And it doesn't take technical sophistication to cut a video out of context. You know, the Nancy Pelosi video, they just slowed it down two frames to make it seem as if she were drunk taking things out of context. So those, to me, deep fakes are a problem, but they exist in a world of much, much bigger problems. Thank you. I'm, uh, hi, my name is John Shikhan. I'm a senior at Tuft. Um, one of the questions that I had was, how does one differentiate between disinformation and like actual, like real news? Because I mean, in my case, personally, I do read both conservative and liberal sources. And a lot of times when I read both of these sources, I will end up seeing facts in one source that is not available in the other or vice versa. And so sometimes I don't know what to trust. And I also think on a, I guess, on a logistical point of view on how to stop misinformation, how does one determine what actually is real news versus disinformation or misinformation, et cetera? <laughs> I, I can take that too, to a degree. I mean, it's tough. Right. I mean, because a lot of times the skill of those running disinformation campaigns and to be clear, again, the difference between misinformation, and disinformation is disinformation. There is an intent to mislead. Mm -hmm. And so this is somebody who is doing something with a purpose and usually are a bit skilled in what they do. So oftentimes things are presented in a way that are very technically challenging or uh, it's reporting about a part of the world or, or something that just average people don't have a deep sort of knowledge set about. So take election disinformation. 
one specific case was in Wisconsin where this sort of disinformation campaign spread that more people voted in Wisconsin than were registered to vote. The way they were able to pull that off is because the numbers they gave were accurate before the actual election day. And then they showed the amount of people who voted. Nobody understood that in Wisconsin, you can register to vote on the day of the election. So that took this deep sort of knowledge of election uh, infrastructure and administration. And so that's how they often kind of pran this. So the, the question of how do you distinguish between them? I mean, obviously there are fact checkers and things like that, but it's, it's, it's challenging. I mean, you have to triangulate sources, but that takes work. And so I don't know if I have a sort of silver bullet solution to that because I've certainly, this is my full-time job. I read articles all the time where I go, I have no idea if I can believe that or not, because I've never been to Afghanistan. I don't know the local context. And so my only thing is, unless you can verify it, don't spread it. This is the biggest problem is when sort of unwitting users amplify it before they verify it themselves. But there are plenty of times I, I don't know either. Thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Antonio Viana. I am a law student at the University of Sao Paulo, and me and my colleagues from the Brazil delegation delivered a presentation on social media and extremism in Brazil, especially how uh, the occurrence of mass messaging in WhatsApp specifically has impacted the results of our past presidential elections in 2018. And as we approach a new cycle, new presidential elections in 2022, I would like to ask well, firstly, Mr. Wilcox, but all panelists are uh, happy, welcome to respond as well. Uh, what could be ways for states to collaborate with social media in uh, during election times to prevent uh, disinformation for altering too much the demo democratic process? Thank you. So I think your question is probably more in the sort of democracy space and uh, I don't want to push that one uh, also to my colleagues, but uh, we're really looking at um, violent extremism online and how violent extremists use social media uh, and the internet. Uh, so uh, these things obviously commingle. They these problem sets overlap, uh, whether it's violent extremism or misinformation and then elections or sort of democracy. But again, I think taking the long view, uh, and this gets to um, the previous uh, person's question, uh, the more developed or sophisticated digital literacy approaches, particularly done at the university level, uh, but also done in high schools, uh, will uh, go through actual exercises, and this is sort of learning by doing, uh, it's not theoretical, uh, how do you sort of do the, you know, fact or the source checking uh, once you determine, well, what is the point of view uh, of this particular uh, article online? And then you go to fact check and source check, and then there are other um, steps. It, it's kept fairly succinct. Uh, digital literacy, but um, it's it's an important skill and not to beat a dead horse, but uh, I think we have to take the long view here. Uh, and we can pull down accounts, uh, but other accounts will pop up. And so um, we need we need citizenries around the world uh, that are better equipped um, you know, from a young age uh, to be able to recognize uh, and uh, reject this stuff. I think part of your question though gets the challenge of open spaces versus closed spaces and our ability to monitor. Facebook is a little bit of a challenge, but it's largely an open platform to degree. Twitter's the easiest. You get into WhatsApp, you get into encrypted chat, we can't see it as researchers or as fact checkers. So I think there is a strategy built in to, again, whether it's a state-backed disinformation campaign or just a political campaign that they want to sort of move people off of open platforms. Like they have to find their audience there. 
so there's still a presence there, but you see often this effort to sort of redirect people to closed spaces or just less policed platform, less well policed platforms. So I think increasingly you will see that in political communication and disinformation campaigns, the effort to really push people away from where it can be content moderated. You see that through sort of SMS campaigns or email campaigns. So that is a concern that I don't have an answer to how we combat, because that would require you essentially to be able to start monitoring closed encrypted spaces, which I don't think people want. Uh, so I don't have a great solution to that problem. Oh, thank you. I think when we we ask questions that do not have yet answers, then we have found a great question, right? Yeah. So thanks a lot for for your comments. Hi, um, I'm Margo Myers. I'm an Epic student here at Tufts. Um, I'm an IR major, but I'm also an environmental studies major. So throughout the presentation, my thoughts go to the fossil fuel industry funding mis or okay disinformation malinformation campaigns um and so I'm, I'm curious if your work ever focuses on that and maybe how that differs when it's a private interest versus maybe state funded or ideologically motivated and i know this isn't violent per se but uh yeah a lot of environmentalists see climate change as a form of slow violence so i'm, I'm curious maybe this can be directed at um miss williams or uh, Mr. Schaefer um, to see what, what you guys think about that as a priority in, in the work you do, if you see that. Thank you. Heather, do you want to take first crack at that? or I'm happy to take second crack at that. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so it's not something that we directly look at. Indirectly, yes, to a degree, because there are also state back interests in environmental campaigns. So we can see. The Russians, for example, actually very actively supporting anti-fracking movements because, of course, Russia is a petrol state and they have their strategic interests in not having more fracking. So you see sometimes state back actors actually jumping onto and latching onto what you generally consider to be a more positive campaign. But that can be really dangerous too, because they can hijack that campaign, they can discredit that campaign by having their fingerprints all over it. But I think the kind of core of your question is how many issues miss dis and malinformation run through. And so whether you're talking about election security, climate change, I mean, environmental issues in general, public health with COVID, it is, it, you can't solve these issues without sort of a baseline of truth. And so that's, I think, the fundamental importance of the work. It's not just sort of political manipulation or the Russian government trying to skew your opinion about Ukraine. You can't have a functioning democracy where two sets of people, two audiences, have entirely different sets of facts. I mean, you can disagree on the facts and debate those. That's what a democracy is. But it stops functioning if you have people living in different worlds. And so you can't solve any of these bigger picture problems like the climate crisis, if you have actors who are able to run sophisticated disinformation campaigns that result in not just the audiences, but policymakers not producing anything effective to deal with those issues. <laughs> yeah, so I, I certainly agree with those, those points. And we've actually done a lot of work on this here at RAND looking at what we call truth decay. Um, and, and truth decay being the increasing volume of opinion relative to fact, the disagreement about what is fact and what is opinion, uh, the declining trust in institutions that disseminate fact, which we consider ourselves one. Um, and, I, and I think something that can be particularly problematic um, here is when these individuals or movements or groups or state actors or whoever it may be that is attempting to promote um, a, a disinformation kind of narrative. Um, what I worry about is when they attack the institutions um, that I think Americans, but and this is an exclusively to Americans, it just so happens that my work tends to look here inside the United States, um, have historically put their trust into. And I think that that is often 
one of the, the major footholds that they that they use um, to to buttress kind of the, those arguments. Um, and we see this a lot. Um, I think it's it's a good example recently to think about COVID nineteen, where uh, some work that my colleagues have done here have looked at the fact that there are some Americans who trust no one anymore as a source of fact. They don't trust journalists. They don't trust policymakers. Um, they don't trust their faith leaders. They don't trust their doctors. Um, and so, if an if an individual needs fact-based information about what is true and what isn't true, if there is literally no institutions that they trust, uh, then you know they're very vulnerable to then just kind of believing whatever they might see on the internet or whatever uh, serves their own personal agenda. So, I mean, I guess in a couple of the questions that I've heard brought up in the last few points that could relate to this question of, of media literacy or digital literacy or how do you know what is true, um, you know, I think it's just important to be careful about recognizing that and there is sometimes an agenda from an individual or uh, a an account if you're online that is putting forth information and to try to describe what that uh, agenda might be uh, before you put trust in this information or before you proliferate this information. So I sort of think of that as part one, but part two, be very skeptical if that is discrediting a, a reputable source of information. You know, when sort of things are saying no media can be trusted or is only liberal media or, you know, no, none of these academic institutions or research institutions can be trusted. I mean, in my mind, they are trying to erode a foundation that actually does lead to literacy so that they can replace it with whatever disinformation that they want to put in, put in its place. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Ian Boldest and I'm a senior here at Tufts and a member of the Epic Colloquium. Uh, going back to your introductory remarks, Mr. Schaefer, although maybe uh, Ms. Wims or Mr. Wilcox can also provide insight on this, especially on the tail end of my question, but what does the current landscape look like or maybe what strategies should look like in terms of addressing uh, dissemination mechanisms used by uh, you're used to spread disinformation and can it or should it look like or be sort of countering or actively tackling these mechanisms or would it more so need to be uh, in terms of like providing transparency on the source or something else and then also sort of what might sort of internet co cooperation between international actors um, look like in sort of uh, or creating a framework um, to sort of address this? Sure. So I'll, I'll leave the cooperation with international actors to my colleagues, who I think probably have some good points on it. On the dissemination question, I think the problem is it's not, it's not a Google problem or a Facebook problem necessarily, because part of it is just the sort of interest in getting your content in front of an audience that when you have a strategic objective, which is different from journalists in the West who are not trying to influence in any sort of malign way. So if you just look at the dissemination around a conspiracy theory, for example, one of the problems is search engines work on freshness. So if you continue to produce content over and over and over, you are likely to show up higher in search rank. And we all know that if you're on the first page of Google, you might as well not exist. People who work in fact checking uh, and debunking even my kind of work, we tend to write one report on an issue and then we let it go. And so a way to counter the dissemination and balance is to disseminate more on the sort of counter narrative. We, we all fall, and I'm guilty of this too. It's like, I've done this. We've already refuted this two years ago. But again, the bad actors, they're publishing every single week. So they flood the zone that manipulates trending algorithm, manipulates the sort of freshness of the search results. So we have to kind of think sometimes, it's sort of called red teaming, think like a bad actor to counter it. So that would be one way of doing it. Then on the transparency question, that's typically where we land on the issue of whether or not 
things like Russian state media should be banned or censored or just more transparency around it. I'm sort of on the radical transparency side of things. I have no problem with someone who wants to go and read Russian state media. I have a problem with Russian state media that covertly funds what appears to be a domestic U.S. outlet. It has no clear indication that is funded from the Russian government. And so that the people consuming that information don't have the context to evaluate whether or not that information is credible. So I think better labeling from the platforms is key. I mean, they started this years ago, but it was really, it was haphazard. I mean, our own internal lists are significantly more robust than Twitter's. So if, you know, we have three people working on it, Twitter's Twitter. So I, I just, I think transparency is actually the key because that allows people to actually evaluate the source. If they want to believe Russian Chinese propaganda, go for it. But that should be clear what you're consuming. And I'll turn to my colleagues if they have a answer on the cooperation sort of internationally. So I think this would get to gift, gift TC. Yeah, so in the case of uh, the GIF CT or the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. Again, this is a public private partnership. It's all the large companies, a number of the smaller platforms and uh, the government is sort of there uh, as uh, observers, if you will. And uh, they have various working groups that look at uh, the questions of algorithms and, and other sort of pertinent topics. Um, the other thing I think that is important here um, is I think we need to um, do a better job internationally of modeling how government and particularly law enforcement institutions uh, actually um, can cooperate with companies, with civil society uh, to share information uh, about, uh, you know, bad actors and what they're doing uh, online. I mean, I'm familiar with this, obviously, mostly in the uh, space of violent extremism and terrorism. Uh, I know that uh, our own uh, domestic law enforcement agencies have, um, you know, established uh, information sharing mechanisms with uh, state and local governments, with, um, you know, the, the private sector, uh, depending on um, the particular case in question. And um, those things are sensitive to freedom of expression and um, again, this approach that I talked about earlier, the um, voluntary and collaborative uh, efforts. And I think those collaborative and voluntary efforts can, can certainly be more um, robust. Um, I think there is a, a challenge in terms of doing them at scale, uh, but the advantage of sharing those approaches with counterparts, law enforcement, criminal justice counterparts in other countries is that it can show or demonstrate tangibly that, you know, you don't just have to like shut the internet down. Uh, I mean, I'm grossly overstating it, obviously, but, you know, suppression or repression is not necessarily um, an effective way to deal with these things. We have to show or model um, the, the, the types of voluntary and collaborative mechanisms that actually can work and actually can deliver some results. Thank you both. Hi, my name is Salome De Prima. I'm also a member of the Epic Colloquium this year. And my question, um, I hope it's not mute, uh, mute after Ian's question, but um, I'm interested in, it feels like there's a common narrative that fragile states incubate extremists and terrorists. But what are your, your views on this counter that in order to establish these extremist organizations on social media, they kind of require liberal institutions like freedom of speech to kind of proliferate? Or in short, does it kind of get to the question that's like with elusive answer that is how do you balance content moderation with freedom of speech? 
<clears throat> so, go ahead, Oliver. Go ahead. No, I was just going <laughs> to say, I mean, the, the issue of fragile states and state fragility, uh, you're getting into a much bigger sort of broader um, issue. I mean, fragile states can be uh, places like uh, the coastal states of West Africa or, you know, Chad and Niger and the Sahel to, um, you know, other countries around the world. So state fragility is a fairly, um, it's kind of an elastic concept. Um, so, you know, what we have seen, obviously, is we've seen violent extremist groups exploit uh, fragile state environments in a number of cases, uh, basically to just establish uh, a presence uh, and to operate and then over time to expand. And in certain cases, that means, you know, taking territory, trying to govern, we'll look at a place like uh, Somalia or parts of Yemen, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's kind of one problem set. I'm not sure how much state fragility has to do with, um, you know, the use of the internet, because the fact is, is that even in places that we think or assume um, have very low internet penetration, uh, take some of the Sahel countries, for example, uh, in Northwest Africa, um, people still have phones and they're still using their phones to read and download content. So um, I think that these are sort of two, two different things. I mean, I think terrorists are exploiting fragile state environments in some cases because there's a lack of governance. Um, but, um, you know, the, the internet and social media is obviously everywhere. So uh, you can be in uh, Raqqa, Syria, when it was the capital of the so-called caliphate, and uh, you can, um, as ISIS did, you know, have uh, so-called media houses that were generating and producing the content. Um, and um, so you can, you can do it almost from anywhere. Yeah, I think my response to that question is, you know, there are different types of terrorists, right? And there are, and even what are we defining terrorism? What are we defining extremism? You know, terrorism may be a pretty uh, charged term. Um, and I think that, you know, what a, a terrorist or extremist um, organization can get out of a fragile state is sort of different out of what they can get out of a liberal state where you have um, greater freedom of speech and the ability for some of these platforms to exist. I also think an important dynamic here when we think about um, extremists inside the United States and extremist discourse, discourse um, in, in the U.S., what we would call sort of domestic extremism, um, is that it, it's not very organizational. So that is something that uh, this movement has been able to use the, the internet to their advantage. Uh, is that they can kind of be in a post-organizational state where you don't have codified institutions, you don't have members of, of institutions. Um, also, the, the large um, majority of individuals who are engaging in extremist discourse in the United States or engaging in far-right extremist discourse, so I think this is also true in a lot of European countries and other democratic countries, um, they may not be willing to physically mobilize for their cause. So um, they may be willing to retweet or engage in propaganda. They may be willing to provide some money to, to the cause. Maybe they're willing to buy, um, you know, a, a t-shirt for an extreme cause or go to a concert, um, but they're not interested in, you know, traveling to Ukraine and, and taking up arms, right, and participating in a conflict that some have framed through a, a white supremacist narrative um, or to go elsewhere in the world. And so there is kind of a difference in what we're talking about in terms of how that extremist activity can manifest and how um, digital engagement has a relationship to that. Thank you. 
Um, hello, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it and for being here with us. My name is Sage Spalter. Um, I'm a second year student at Tufts and also a part of um, the Epic Colloquium. Uh, my question is to Ms. Williams. Um, a student studying global, global governance and cooperation and emerging in spaces where contending extremism and battling misinformation will be of critical importance. What advice would you give to us entering this field? Um, with this work ever evolving in nature, do you project or foresee a focus in the work that will become more relevant over the next few years? Um, and if not, do you see the work broadening or narrowing in, in scope at all? Students who are, students who are uh, studying extremism specifically? Um, not necessarily specifically. Um, I am just curious for all of us um, who have been you know, learning throughout this semester about global cooperation and governance and how this will probably be relevant for us all in our careers. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, I I may not have the best advice as sort of my my lane is still somewhat quite narrow here, but I think for um, those who are, are thinking about these issues that we've been talking about today, in my mind, where uh, the greatest need is, you know, where there sort of is still a lot of room to contribute to this issue um, is one, as I know Oliver's brought up a, a few times, and I completely echo, is kind of media liter literacy, digital literacy, how to actually promote that, uh, how to um, further that literacy. Um, when we think also about um, counter extremism efforts, there is a move to think about this through other than securitized approaches. So to think about it through a more of a public health framework, to think about how to build resilience. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done on inoculation, which is where you would try to help um, prevent an individual from being swayed by an extreme narrative or being swayed by, by misinformation. Um, I think that those are um, areas where as I said, there, there's still a lot of room to contribute. A lot of individuals who have worked on counter extremism um, for the last 20 years have looked at this through often the lens of, um, of Sunni jihadism, uh, working on Al-Qaeda and working on ISIS. Um, and I think uh, even the thing, I don't, I don't know the misinformation kind of disinformation space as well as Brett does, but, you know, when we're talking about you know, Russia and Chinese influence um, and adversary influence in, in other states. You know, people who have been looking at Russia and China 20 years ago, 30 years ago, have a certain framework and a mindset as well. So I, I think that that is where there can be a diversity of opinions that I'm really excited about what graduating classes can kind of add to these fields. Thank you. So maybe uh, what I would add uh, since I've uh, been foot stomping uh, digital and media literacy, and uh, I don't want to do that again. Uh, the other thing, and, and again, uh, I think our colleague who's uh, there with you all in person can say a lot more about this, but the other piece of this um, that's in some ways more foundational uh, than digital literacy, although I think digital literacy efforts can and do start quite young, I mean, if you consider media reports that uh, you have um, children in the UK as young as 12 uh, that are uh, looking at um, racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism con extremist content online, uh, and in the context of that country, they're being, you know, referred to social services. Uh, this is part of the, the UK Prevent Program. Um, so, you know, it, it, it can go, it can go quite young, but I think before you even get to that point, um, just basic civic education. And again, uh, you know, that kind of thing has been, um, I think across countries either not funded in the first place or done poorly in the first place. Uh, it, um, you know, has declined in funding here in the United States. Uh, STEM is getting billions of dollars uh, and civic education is, uh, you know, getting millions of dollars. Uh, so uh, I think that, you know, that's something that is an important um, corollary 
Uh, and we have good examples of um, how civic education or how basic values um, can be built. Uh, if you take a look at the, uh, again, in an international context, the uh, Thousand and One Nights uh, cartoons uh, that are uh, number one on Al Jazeera Children's Channel. And uh, in a number of countries, uh, they've been translated. Uh, and in some cases, ministries of education have trained teachers uh, to use them as part of the curriculum uh, on a pilot basis. And they have workbooks. And so again, there's that online offline uh, connection. So there's a real world example of how the education space, um, you know, is slowly kind of trying to catch up to and respond uh, to this problem. But again, uh, I think, Brett, you'd have more to say on the sort of civic education or civic values uh, work. Yeah, I, I was going to make a slightly different point on the benefit of having a social science background blended with some technical expertise. The people who really understand how information systems work often can't explain it at a policy level and vice versa. And this is a real problem when you have policymakers who fundamentally don't understand the things we're trying to regulate. I mean, if you've seen Facebook hearings with Mark Zuckerberg, they're often quite embarrassing. <laughs> and so the extent to which you can blend those two things to at least, I mean, you don't need to have deep expertise, but at least explain the policy side of it to policymakers and explain the tech, but also vice versa for those building systems. And so it's sort of built into their thought process from the beginning, the kind of idea of adversarial design, like how would a bad actor use this in ways that would be problematic? So both ways, I think it's important to kind of blend those two uh, sort of layers of expertise because often those two communities do not speak the same language. Thank you all. Hi, my name is Brianna McGowan. I am a senior and I'm also a part of uh, I'm the EPIC uh, participant. And I guess this question kind of goes to like anyone who can answer it. Um, my question is, how do individual extremists learn different strategies regarding dis or malinformation um, on social media considering that in some cases, it seems that so state organized, um, state organization and state funding. Um, and I'm wondering if you found there to be any key platforms for sharing this knowledge about um, strategies. I can't speak to the extremist side, but I can speak to yeah, states learning from one another. And we've definitely seen that over the years. I mean, I think it's a little bit of a overused cliche to say, you know, China is adopting the Kremlin playbook, but you can see learning. And there's often been the question of what to, what degree of coordination exists there. I don't think they're going to seminars together to learn manipulation techniques, but you just have to sort of watch social media and see what works and learn the tactics. So there's absolutely sort of authoritarian learning by looking at what has been successful in the past, also seeing how to, ways of circumventing uh, platform content moderation, for example. So uh, from the state side, I don't think there is that sort of direct person to person learning happening, but they're absolutely starting to mirror each other in the tactics and techniques used. And I think that's just frankly, like good social media monitoring. You know, you study what's worked, you uh, adopt it, you, tinker with it a little bit, but we can clearly see that. Yeah, so on the extremist side, I mean, I think that there's kind of two points here of, you know, how do they learn how to package a, a narrative in in misinformation and, and, and disinformation, and then what would be the tactics to disseminate it? And on that first question, I mean, the whole narrative is based on to some extent of falsehood, right, from, from its inception. Um, so that's not a hard thing, I think, for extremists to generally do, because what they are selling is some sort of manipulation of the truth. Uh, now, the question of how do they proliferate it, how do they disseminate it, I mean, I think that there is plenty of opportunity uh, for trial and error here. It's, it's not like you know, they, they could tweet a hundred times and one of those tweets could resonate and they can see what worked. And it's not like they're going to be faulted 
for the 99 times that it didn't work. It didn't resonate. Nobody felt the need to, to re-engage it. So, um, you know, they, they can continue to just try and see when they're effective and then when that works to, to do it again um, and to, to build on it. Um, and no one's kind of tallying the wasteland of where they fail. I guess I would just say that like in any group, but really particularly when you're talking about racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, you're talking about networks, uh, loosely affiliated networks. Some are more sophisticated than others. So your question really uh, gets at those that have the time uh, and the maybe knowledge, skills, and ability, even at a minimal level, to do the packaging and to do the disseminating in a more sophisticated, attractive, compelling way, right? Um, but a lot of what you're going to see and what you do see is really just um, fanboys, right? That's what we used to, um, you know, talk about with respect to ISIS, particularly in its early years, was ISIS fanboys, those that are just, um, you know, retweeting, sharing, doing the sort of basic level of engagement. Um, so uh, I think we have to keep in mind um, those sort of different levels of, um, you know, sharing or, um, you know, disseminating. Um, some will do it more and better uh, than others. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists for providing a nuanced insight into the topic of social media, extremism, and misinformation. Also, a big thank you to our audience for being so engaged with the panel. Can we have a round of applause for all our panelists? We start again tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. with the panel on power, equity, and the global climate crisis. Once again, thank you all so much for coming, and we hope you have a great evening.